What I'm doing this morning is introducing to you a three-week mini-series, just a short look, at John chapter 15. So go ahead and turn there. John chapter 15. We're going to take a look at uh, the first 11 verses today, although I have to be honest with you, mostly today I'm introducing uh, kind of an overview we're going to unpack some things in the next two weeks. So some of you, I'll be real blunt, are going to walk away a little disappointed today. Because you're like, well, Scott, you said, but you didn't explain it, right? Well, you know, deal with it, okay? Come back next week and you'll get it. And so now that's kind of what we're going to do because time does not allow for me to fully unpack this very rich, very good a passage of Scripture. Now, it's appropriate, John 15, because it's the first of the year, or at least it's very early in the year. And if you're like me, you've set some goals this year. Call them resolutions, call them objectives, whatever you want. Uh, You have, I hope, like I have, uh, sat down, taken some time between the uh, Christmas and New Year and reviewed 2014's written goals and written or rewritten or updated those goals for 2015. And I did that. And uh, I want to accomplish some things during 2015. You want to be somewhere, you want to achieve something in 2015, and you have hopefully made some a written provision for that, a target to head toward. The problem that you and I have, as the disciples did in John 15, we just don't know what the year's going to hold for us. So while I've written out goals and an entire page of them, and I've put in place some plans to achieve those goals, God willing... The reality is I have no idea where I'm going to be December 31st, what my life's going to be like December 31st, 2015, as we sit here on the 11th of January, 2015. What's so appropriate is in John 15, that's exactly where the disciples found themselves. let's, Let's place ourselves with them in the Gospel of John. For three years, they have followed Jesus Christ. They've given their hearts to Him. They have believed in Him as the Savior, the King, the one who would redeem them. They have seen miracle after miracle after miracle. I'm talking about front row witness to history. Walking on water. Now, I know you can do that up the street here at that pond this time of year, but you can't do it all the time. He he walked on water. Jesus fed 5,000. Deaf heard, those who couldn't speak spoke, and dead came to life. That's a good three years. Here they sit together in the upper room, just the 11. It's very important to understand that John 14, 15, and 16, which contains this, this conversation Jesus has with his men, does not include Judas. The betrayer has already left the room. It's only Jesus' closest followers that are there. They have just asked the question, Lord, is this the time you're going to establish the kingdom? I mean, the the undercurrent of that question is, Lord, if you're the king, do we get to be in your cabinet? Uh, We're fitting ourselves for crowns. Is that the right thing? Within 12 hours, Jesus will be arrested. Before the sun sets again, he'll be dead. Every one of them will deny and flee from him abject failures of where they think they are, as this is being said. And in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, only hours before he will bear the sin of the world, Jesus prepares his followers, and by extension, not just them, but us in this generation, for what the future holds. Jesus delivers by way of conversation, preparation for whatever the year ahead holds us. And before we center our attention on John chapter 15, I want us to walk through the entire conversation as his disciples experienced it because on six occasions during the talk, he will say, I have said these things for, and he lists a reason why. 
And you and I need to hear the reasons why we should spend a little time at the beginning of the year reading John chapter 15. So let's begin our study of John 15 by looking at John 14, uh, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Hey, as you stand on the cusp of a new year, as we face whatever inevitable successes and challenges we have, it starts there. Don't have a troubled heart. Believe in Jesus, and by extension, believe in God. Look at 14, uh, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. I, I... I have something to deliver to you in person, Jesus said, that will sustain you for the days ahead. Look at John chapter 14, verse 29. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that it, when it does take place, you may, what's the word, what's the word? You may believe. Hey, as the year unfolds, good, bad, or indifferent. For some of us, 215 is going to be the best year of our lives. You'll make more money, have better success, be in better health, and have a better family life than you've ever had. God bless you. Believe. For some of you, 2015 may be the worst year of your life. You may lose more money, lose a job, have a health scare, or have whatever the worst family crisis you can imagine. That may await you. Believe. For most of us, 2015 will unfold much like 2014. We'll do our best day after day, week after week. We'll go to work, we'll get up, we'll do our work, we'll go home, we'll watch a movie, we'll go to bed. (laughs) We'll come to church, we'll make friends, we'll have successes, we'll have disappointments. Believe. Look at chapter 15, verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that you, that my joy may be in you and that your, that your joy may be full. Why do we need to spend time in John 15 this time of year? To believe and that our joy would be full. Not happiness, which is related to what my circumstances are at any given moment. A depth of delight in God that rises above my circumstance. Jesus said, I've said these things, the things we're going to study, so that your joy might be full. John 15, verse 17. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Believe, have an overcoming fullness of joy, and go through life with a love for one another that surpasses circumstance. John chapter 16, verse 1. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. That's a verse some of you need to hear. Some of you need to hear, this is the year to draw near. There's a danger some of you stand on the edge of falling away from God. Jesus said, I've said some things to you so that you don't fall away. Some of my words are going to sustain you when you are tempted to walk away from God and shipwreck your life. Chapter 16, verse 4. I've said these things to you that when their, their hour comes, you will remember that I told you. When the crisis hits, we're not going to fall away, we're going to remember. You know, Jesus said something about that. We need to hear that at the beginning of the year because we don't know what's going to happen in March and July and September. And so believe, have joy, develop love, and don't fall away. And remember, look at chapter 16, verse 12. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How does that sound? You and I are so impatient for explanation. Come on, God, tell me. You owe me. Men who had been with him for three years said, guys, you're just not ready for some of the things that are going to happen to you. And I can't even explain them to you, honestly. This year, some things are going to happen. You're going to go before God and say, hey, why? Remember John 16, 12? You're not ready. You're not ready to know why. Just don't fall away. Just believe. Live in the joy. Look at chapter 16, verse 33. It's my, of the, of the six reasons why he's spoken to us these things, this is my favorite. It's where I get the theme of the next three weeks' message. I have said these things to you that in me you may have, say it with me, please. Oh, that's good. The rest of you should join. I've said these things to you that in me you may have. Now listen, listen to what he says. In the world you will have tribulation. As one old preacher said, when God brings tribulation, he expects us to tribulate. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So, believe. Have joy. A relationship that's based on love, that's not falling away. Peace. That's a good year, right? So let's not dither any longer. Look at John chapter 15, verse 1. Because the question has to be answered. How can I have an overcoming kind of year in 2015? Let me give you the thesis statement of this message. 2015 will be a year I overcome to the degree that I know, hear, and follow Jesus Christ. I don't have a secret to success, mostly because there is no secret to success. But I know if on December 31st that you are knowing, hearing, and following Jesus Christ, this is a good year. I've said these things, Jesus said, so that you may have peace, so that you will overcome. John 15, incredibly familiar passage. And let me just, let me just take two minutes and introduce it to you. Many folks have heard this preached. It's a very familiar passage, as I've said. As a devotion. You know, abide in me. I am the vine. You think, well, what, what I get out of John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What I get out of that is basically have good thoughts about Jesus, come to church, read my Bible, and pray. It's a devotion approach to John 15. By the way, all of those are great things. I strongly suggest you do those things this year. But that's not at all what John 15 is about. John 15 is not about devotion. It's about salvation. When Jesus said, look at 15.1, I, I am the vine, the true one, the genuine one. I am the true vine. My father is the, anybody here named George? That's the word. I am George. It, the word means farmer in the original. I am the, the vine dresser. I'm the gardener. I am the vine, the genuine one. My father is the vine dresser, Jesus is saying. When he said that, that would have risen images very clearly in the ears of the apostles. It would have had very clear images in the mind of those 11 men. Jesus is not saying... Um, have devotions. Look a little further. I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener or the vine dresser or the farmer. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, Jesus, master teacher that he is, in this text is using words that rhyme somewhat poetic, and it's, it's a little bit lost. It's hard to capture in our language, but it's like this. 
Every branch in me that does bear fruit, verse, the end of verse 2, he, he, he prunes clean. The word prune and clean, are, they sound exactly alike. It's like saying a train and a train. Like you ride one and you learn the other one, right? And every one that my father, the, the branch in me, my father, he prunes it clean. Now look at verse 3, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are, here's the same word, clean. You are one in which the Father has already been at work. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I, now he makes it explicit what's been assumed until now. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me... You can do nothing. Did you notice, by the way, the development? Fruit, uh, then the branch is pruned and it bears more fruit, and then when the branch abides, it bears much fruit. There's fruit, more fruit, much fruit. This is God's will for us, that we become uh, much more productive in our, uh, in our lives, in our walk with Christ. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 is a very sobering verse and one in which, quite honestly, we shouldn't soften the blow of what it means. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Gee, what's that mean? That sounds ominous, like judgment, like eternal judgment, like separation from God, like eternal torment. Well, that's what it is. <laughs> that's why this is not a text on having daily devotions. This is a text about where salvation is found. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And, and from there on down, he's going to talk about how we have power in prayer and, and we understand his word and there's joy and there's love for one another. But all of it grows out of being connected to the vine. So uh, we have a picture, I think, of a grape arbor. Is that right? Can we put that up? Jesus said, uh, I am the vine. See that thick vine there on the left where the life of the soil is transported into the, the branches there on the right. See the, the tendrils on the branches? You, child of God, you believer in Jesus Christ, we are the branches. He sustains, supports, provides life. He is the branch. Uh, he is the vine. We are the branches. And the only way one knows that a branch is still connected to the vine is because it produces what? What's it produce? Fruit. All right, let's talk about what does this mean. You say, wow, man, Scott, you, for some reason you're pretty fired up about this. Well, like I said, I've been out of the pulpit for two weeks, so i got a lot to say. Mostly because this is so transformative when we understand this. Here, here's what he said. To those 11 men who had followed Jesus for those three years, who had seen him miracles and now rising conflict, and, and were just convinced he was the king of Israel, which, by the way, he is, when he said, I am the true, the genuine, the real vine, they probably would have thought of place they had just walked past, the temple. Because on the temple, in gold filigree, was a vine with golden grapes. And rich people could actually add more gold to that if they wanted in their name, in their honor, more gold added to this, this great grapevine there. The reason for that is because the symbol of the people of God in the Old Testament is a vine. If I were to say to you, for example, I am the stars and stripes, what does that raise in your mind? What? The flag. It represents the United States. To say Jesus, for him to say, I am the vine, would have immediately risen in their mind, oh, wait a minute, you're talking about what God has done through his people in all the Old Testament. In fact, in Psalm 80, there's this great reference that says, Lord, you brought your vine out of Egypt. You planted it. It bore fruit. Why are we having trouble now? In Isaiah 5, heavy, heavy prophecy, the Lord recounts and says, I planted a vine, and I took care of it. And I built a hedge around it, and I looked for grapes, and I got nothing but sour grapes. And in a word of judgment, he said, I will tear down the hedge. I will uproot the vine. Now here's Jesus sitting around this table with his men saying, you want to know who the true vine is? I am the vine. 
What he meant by this is what God is doing by way of salvation is not happening in an ethnic people, Israel. It's not happening in a temple, and it's not happening through the priest. It's not happening. It's happening in Jesus Christ, which is why when, it's, when he says, if you don't abide, the idea is just to remain, to dwell, to live in, to make this a part of your life. If you don't abide in him, you, like a, a branch that is taken away and withers, will be judged this is about salvation. In 2015, if I'm going to overcome, I've got to begin by understanding I am hopeless apart from my connection with Jesus Christ when it comes to salvation. In fact, let me um, give you something to think about there. Over overcoming requires that I understand bearing fruit is God's purpose for me this year. We want to know what God wants out of us. It's that we, in response to our relationship with Jesus Christ, bear fruit. Well, Scott, what is the fruit? Well, I'll tell you in a couple of weeks, okay? But I can tell you this, as Jesus said, apart from him, when it comes to the issue of salvation and producing the fruit that is evidence of that salvation, apart from him, we can do, somebody remind me how much? How much again? Nothing. You got, how much? See, you're not with me. How much can we do without Jesus? It relates to our salvation. How much can we do? Do you name your cars? Yeah, you're like, dude, where are you going? Trust me, follow me, we'll get there. Do you name your cars? We name our cars. And so uh, late December into January, we had some family trouble. And um, Mr. Ziffel was not feeling well. And Flo Rider had reached the end of her useful life. So we had some decisions to make. And so uh, Mr. Ziffel went to the doctor and got fixed. And Flo got traded in for Jack Sterling. Uh, Jack Sterling is silver colored. And so Jack and Sterling both references to money. And uh, he costs us money. And we hope to get all our money's worth out of him. So um, we now have a silver car, Jack, and we still have uh, Mr. Ziffel that's been paid for for 13 years. He's 18 years old, 200,000 miles. I paid for him once. The kids are paying for it now by having to drive him. But Mr. Ziffel keeps dying. I mean, literally, going down North Avenue, boom, dead. Nothing. No power, no horn, nothing. No, like you were sitting in a car with no keys in it, well, clearly this is a dangerous thing. So about the 47th time my kids told me that happened, I took him to the dealer. That's the doctor. And uh, they diagnosed Mr. Ziffel with a problem of being disconnected. You see, after 18 years and 200,000 miles, his starter, there's something, I guess, like brushes or something that create an electrical charge when you, they had worn down. So he was powerless. There was no connection whatsoever between what you did with this key and the power of the battery in the engine. For you and me to attempt to live a, a life of power, to attempt to have a relationship with God apart from the connection to the vine is just like Mr. Ziffel sitting on the side of the road, useless and dead. Apart from the vine, when it comes to salvation, we can do nothing and yet God's desire for me is fruit, and I can't do it on my own, apart from the connection to the vine. And so people try, people try. They often have the list. Listen, I believe the right things. I got the doctrine thing right. Or I do the right things. I have been, fill in the blank, baptized, confirmed, first communion, member of this church, small group, da 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 By the way, uh, let me just clarify. I am for all of those things. We should do all those things. I'm, I'm, I'm in that camp. But every single one of those things follows after, flows out of being connected to the vine. Because apart from the vine, I'm somebody, I have a bad memory, remind me. But apart from the vine, I can do how much? Okay? So if we're going to bear fruit this year, if we're going to recognize this is what God wants for me this year, I've got to stop at the beginning of the year and say, am I connected to the vine? Now, you say, well, what does that mean? Let's be real clear about this. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 is really important to understand this text. Already, and it's plural, already you are 
clean. He means to those 11 sitting there at that table, already you're connected to the vine and already God has begun to prune. And boy, would he do more pruning in their lives. You are not in danger, Jesus is saying. You are not in danger of withering away and being taken away and burned in judgment. What does it mean? Let's think about those. So how can you be, how can you be in the vine? How can you then wither uh, and be thrown away and face judgment? Well, let's talk about who just walked out 20 minutes before Jesus had this conversation. Judas Iscariot, who spent three years experiencing the exact same things the disciples did, and on that night chose to leave and to go carry that bag of silver and sell Jesus and his own soul for 30 bag, uh, pieces of silver. He was near Jesus. It's as though he was in the vine, but he was never connected. He withered and he faced judgment. Jesus called him a son of hell, a son of condemnation. And he said he went to the place he deserved to go. That's serious stuff. There is is an accounting for those not attached to the vine. You know, turn there, but John chapter 6, verse 66, Jesus is teaching, he's on the bread of life, and, and he gets very blunt and direct. And the Bible says, John 6, 66, from that time, many people who used to follow him don't follow him anymore. They turn back and they quit following Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, so you don't fall away, they fell away. Jesus had an interesting response to that. He turned to the disciples, these 11, or these 12, because Judas was there, and he asked a question, Will you also leave me? Man, it's a heavy question. It's hard. We're not popular anymore. Following him has begun to exact a cost. Will you also leave me? Love. This is how Peter became the spokesman for the disciples. He said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's why Jesus said, you're already clean. And by the way, what's he say? You're clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Word plural, meaning the message of the gospel. The way we're in the vine, connected to the vine, is not through our own efforts, not through joining a a particular church. It's through the word of God. That is through the gospel. Jesus said, guys, you've believed already. You're already clean. God is already doing his pruning, refining, fruit-building work in your life. Um, oh well. All right, let's um, let's kind of let's go to the let's go to the close here. Let me uh, let me give you a let me give you a last thought, and I want to tell you a story. I think it'll illustrate where I'm going on this whole abiding in Christ, and I can't do anything apart from the vine. And here's the principle: overcoming requires that I understand fruit is only produced by abiding in Christ this year. Some of you are going to face the temptation to turn your back and walk away from your relationship with Christ this year. Don't do that. We cannot, I will not, soften the weight of what Jesus said. There are those that appear to be a part of the vine that walk away, they wither, and judgment awaits. Bearing fruit is not about being in the vineyard. It's not about being close to the vine. It's about being in, connected, the, life, the life-giving flow of life through the vine. Um, Christmas Eve, I told you the story of Louis Zamperini. They made the movie Unbroken. The book is way better. I normally wouldn't quote this extensively. But I want you to hear the story of how he got connected to the vine, to use the analogy I'm using this morning. And I want you to hear it from his own words, as told to his biographer. Zamperini was a remarkable man. Not only did he live to be 97, that on the face of it is remarkable, he ran in the 36 Olympics, setting a record that stood for 15 years. He was 19. He enlisted in the, uh, enlisted in the Army Air Corps, served in the Pacific for two and a half years until he was captured. That was after 47 days at sea in a life raft. Two and a half years in Japanese captivity. Lieutenant Watanabe, they nicknamed this man the bird because he strutted around 
used, abused, and killed several prisoners. Zamperini hated the bird. 45, the late summer, they were freed. The Allies won the war. By October of 45, he was back home in Southern California, Torrance, where he grew up and loved that area. By 1950, he was married to a gorgeous woman from the East who had come out. He had met on a tour of Miami as he was giving speeches about his experiences, making a ton of money. And they had a beautiful little girl, a daughter. But Louis Zamperini, as much as he could handle all of the challenges of his life till then, failed when it came to success. By five years after the war, 1950, he was an alcoholic to the point of having days he would not remember. He blacked out. He had nightmares so bad he was afraid to sleep at night, which is why he began drinking to put himself to sleep. His relationship in free fall to the point that Cynthia left him and went back east. She made a return trip to gather her things to settle how the divorce was going to take place, bringing their beautiful little daughter with them in October of 1950. That also happened to be the time that a young guy, 32 years old, named Billy Graham, was beginning at the Los Angeles Crusades. Cynthia went at the invitation of the neighbors across the hall. She trusted Christ. And she decided that relationship was worth saving. And she pleaded with Louis, come to hear this guy. Louis said, no way. Abusive, nasty. Day after day, finally she talked him into coming one night. He went, got so furious, he got up and left when Billy Graham said, now every head bowed, every eye closed. You remember that old, you know, Billy Graham, where he ended a service. Sunday rolled around, and she pleaded again, Louie, it's worth this try. Come with me one more night. He agreed on the condition that when Billy Graham said every head bowed, every eye closed, they would leave. I'll pick it up in his own words from there. Louis shone with sweat. He felt accused, cornered, pressed, and had a frantic urge to flee. As Graham asked for the heads to bow and eyes to close, Louis stood abruptly, rushed for the street, towing Cynthia behind him. He felt enraged, violent, on the edge, about to explode. He wanted to hit someone. As he reached the aisle, he stopped. Cynthia, the rows and rows of bowed heads, the sawdust on the floor, and the tent overhead all disappeared. And what rose in his mind is a vision of him on the raft. A promise given from cracked and bleeding lips eight years prior. A promise he had made but never kept. God, if you will save me from this raft, I will serve you the rest of my life. And in that moment, clear as a bell, he heard those words come back to him. It was the last flashback he would ever have. Louis let go of Cynthia and turned toward Graham. He plowed his way down front. He felt supremely alive. That night, Cynthia kept her eyes on Louis all the way home. When they entered the apartment, Louis went straight to his cache of liquor. It was the time of night when he began to feel the need. For the first time in five years, Louis had no desire to drink. He carried the bottles to the sink, opened them, poured their contents into the drain. He hurried through the apartment, gathering packs of cigarettes and the hidden stash of girly magazines that he had, and he sent them down the trash chute. In the morning, he woke, feeling cleansed. For the first time in five years, the bird had not come to him in a dream the previous night. The bird would never come to his dreams again. Louis dug out the Bible that had been issued to him by the Air Corps and had been mailed home to his mother when the Air Corps thought he was dead. He took the Bible, walked to the park. He found a spot under a tree, sat down, and began reading Resting in the shade and in the stillness, Louis felt a profound peace he'd never felt in all his life. He was not the worthless, broken, forsaken man the bird had tried to make of him. In a single silent moment, his rage, his fear, his humiliation and helplessness had fallen away. He believed. 
He was a new creation. Softly he wept. I mean, that's a great story. But the follow-up's even better. Louis lived 61 years after that night and walked with the Lord every day of his life. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Heavenly Father, Lord, so badly I want people to understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about having a better daily devotion. It's about Him being the only source of nourishment, the vine. The only hope of eternal life is Him. So God, I pray for men and women here today who are trusting to being near the vine or in the vineyard or attending church or keeping the commandments or trusting that mom and dad believe or grandmother. And I pray that by faith we would ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior. That He died, was buried, and rose again to be the vine. To provide eternal life. God, that we would cease from our trying, from our going astray, from our pride, and believe. God, some here have believed for many years and they are struggling, Lord, not in trying harder, but in being connected to the vine will we find fruit and peace. Lord, I pray that this year would be a year of fruit bearing for us, not because we set great goals, work longer hours, but because the very center of our being, our identity, the the source of our strength is a living relationship with the true vine. Hear our prayer, God. Help us bear fruit for you this year. And I ask this in Jesus' strong name and all God's people agreed by saying, Amen.